before we introduce Rodney, I wanted to just share, let me make sure we got everyone here, that um, I consider Rodney a friend of mine. Uh, we met happenstance, although there's no such thing in Judaism. Rodney was uh, helping his wife, who was trying to get on the ballot to be a Madison School Board um, representative, I think, if I'm correct. And he needed, he was just out there getting signatures and I couldn't sign, it was Shabbos. So I said, hey, you know what? If you give me the paper, I will take care of it after Shabbos. So after Shabbos, he, first of all, if you learn and about Rodney, uh, his comment was like, how many papers, one or two? <laughs> A paper is 15 signatures. So I went around asking other people in the neighborhood. That was my only time I've ever stumped for anyone. Um, getting people to sign on to her uh, campaign to act, just put her on the ballot. And I know that um, they had plenty more than they needed, not because of me, but uh, his wife is a great person, Sasha, and uh, their two daughters are great kids as well. So I'm very honored to have Rodney here today. And Rodney is somebody who, if you do get to know him, he is somebody who's given a lot of his time just to service of this community and of our country. Um, being a lawyer, he did not have to join the Air Force as a volunteer in the JAG Corps Reserves, um, but he did. And so I just want to read a little bit about him for those of you who don't know, for those of you who don't know him. So Major Rodney Glassman is a highly respected attorney at Boos Gilbert McCroder, uh, currently serves as a major in the U.S. Air Force JAG Corps Reserve. He has extensive public administration experience, having successfully served as both an appointed town manager and an elected city councilman. Rodney is a licensed real estate broker and has held leadership roles in the home building industry. And lastly, and I think this is the most important part, but Rodney puts it lastly in his little bio, is that he's a husband, father, proud Eagle Scout, who currently serves on the board of Jewish National Fund, Arizona chapter, and his family attends Congregation Beth Israel here in Scottsdale. So I would love uh, to share the floor now with Rodney and allow him to share about his um, specifically, of course, about his time in the Air Force and his volunteering as a JAG, being Jewish doing that, and of course, anything else um, that he likes to share about his different uh, projects that he's on. So here, Rodney. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Rodney Glassman, and I'm excited to be with you. And we were, uh, we were just coming across the nation. I was talking to my wife about you know, like, having the opportunity to visit with you all today because we love Levy and the Levitov family. And uh, she said, she, it was interesting because as, as I was reflecting on my service in the Air Force, um, there's a tremendous, tremendous, Levy, can you take me off so it's not my head I'm looking at? I like looking at everyone else instead. Sorry about that. On you, Rodney, on your computer. I think the gallery view. Good. I feel much more comfortable now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so what's crazy about and, and, and just really wonderful about my Air Force service is that there is a wonderful line uh, involving our Jewish faith throughout. Um, I grew up, for, for background, I grew up in Fresno, California, which has a very, very, very small Jewish community, about 300 families, the same 300 families that were probably there when I was growing up. And uh, eventually moved to Chicago, went to high school in Chicago because I played ice hockey did my freshman year at Cornell, and then ended up in Tucson at the University of Arizona uh, for my undergraduate to run a family business down there all the way through uh, grad school, uh, resulting eventually in law school where I met my you know, wonderful Jewish wife in law school, and we now live uh, at 32nd and Camelback um, and have two little girls. But uh, so growing up in Fresno uh, with the small Jewish community, when it came time to join the Boy Scouts, my father signed me up for the troop that was ran by all of his friends who were lawyers who helped run the Boy Scout Council. Uh, and they all happened to be LDS. So I joined uh, the Mormon Boy Scout troop and they needed to give me a leadership role. Uh, but uh, what leadership role do you give to the kid that only goes to half the meetings? Because back in the day, the LDS troops met on Tuesdays and Sundays. So they met after church, but obviously I would have been at Sunday school with my Jewish friends. And so the only role they could give me, because I didn't know how to play the bugle, was assistant chaplain. So as the little Jewish kid in the Mormon Boy Scout troop, I was the assistant chaplain of my Mormon Boy Scout troop. 
Um, and this was age 11 and 12. So they would let me do all the prayers in Hebrew, like Jesus used to do, they would say. And so I grew up uh, very connected because of our Jewish faith with the LDS community. Got my Eagle Scout when I was 13 and have always just really been involved in community service, be it the Board of the Boy Scouts, uh, Jewish National Fund. When I was 20, I joined uh, when I was in Tucson and I got on the board of the JCC. I was the youngest board member there and Desert Caucus. Any way to get involved, I always, I just enjoyed it. I was always working and I was always involved in the community. And back when I was about 23 years old, I wanted to join the Air Force. And my mother, uh, my Jewish mother, who's also a dentist, uh, said no. And so I went to Washington, D.C. and worked for congressman instead and spent a year on Capitol Hill and then came back and got my Ph.D. in arid land resource sciences, which is water from the University of Arizona, and then eventually my law degree. And it was while in law school that I ran for city council, got elected. And it was while in law school during my last semester that I happened to be home in Fresno. And we went to a hockey game, my girlfriend, now wife, and a gal from Sunday school that I grew up with named Jessica. Last name will not be used because uh, of where the story is going. And she came to the house to get us. And she said that, uh, I said, what are you doing these days? And she said, she just got out of the Navy. And I said, why'd you get out of the Navy? She said, because I didn't pass the bar. And I said, why do you have to be a, a, you know, why do you have to pass the bar to be in the Navy? She said, because I was going to be a Jag. And I said, well, what's a Jag? And my wife, the girlfriend at the time elbowed me and said, weren't you paying attention during the on-campus interviews? And I said, no, I was busy chasing you and busy running for city council and trying to get, get out of law school. And she said, well, a Jag is a lawyer in the military. And for those of you that remember way back in the day, um, there was only one JAG Corps. There was one lawyer service for the entire military. Um, in today's military, each branch has their own JAG Corps. So each branch, uh, each has a Sec Secretary of Air Force, Secretary of the Marines, Secretary of Navy, and then they have uh, usually a four star, which is the JAG, T JAG, the Judge Advocate General. And as this happened, my friend Jessica, I uh, had left the Navy, but I was super excited because in the back of my head, I had always wanted to be in the military, specifically the Air Force, because that's what we had in Tucson. And so at nine o'clock on a Friday night at the hockey game, I called uh, the colonel who ran Davis Moffin Air Force Base, a fellow named Lofbaum. I had his cell number because I had worked with him when I was on uh, the congressional aide. And the, the wing commanders at all the Air Force bases, they pass off the cell phone. So the cell number always stays the same. So if you ever get a wing commander cell phone, just keep it because when the next wing commander comes, he'll have the old cell phone number as well. So I called Colonel Lofbaum and I said, Colonel, active duty Colonel runs the base. I said, do you know anything about the JAG reserves? Do you have that? And he said, I have no idea, but I'll connect you uh, with my head lawyer, the staff judge advocate for the base. She'll be able to tell you. So when I... When I, when I got back to, 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 to Tucson at the time, I went and I visited uh, with this uh, wonderful lady. She was Lieutenant Colonel. And she said, well, if you wanna be in the Air Force, the first thing you have to do is you have to pass the bar because I had just graduated. And so that was in uh, December. And I took the bar in February, uh, being my father's a lawyer. Uh, and I have lots of lawyers in my family. So my dad said, uh, he said, he said, just take in Tucson, if you graduate in December, there is no bar review in January, because not that many people graduate during the winter. So my dad said, uh, just take it cold. I'll pay for it. If you fail, you know, you pay for the next time, you know, but you'll know what the test looks like, you know, for all of you with kids, you probably said something like that. And so I took the bar cold and uh, I'll be damned four months later, got my results and I passed, which was wonderful. And my first call was to who? The Lieutenant Colonel at the Air Force Base. Cause that was, I was so excited about joining the JAG Corps. And so I went to see her and she, she was sitting there and she looked at me and she said, uh, well, I have a question for you. Uh, how tall are you? And I said, six, six. And she said, how much do you weigh? And at the time I, I was 295 pounds. Uh, one of my, one of my big regrets in life is that I never hit 300 pounds. I, was, I just never got there. But uh, I, she said, she said 295. And she looked at me, she said, well, you have two choices. You either have to, uh, grow four inches, or you have to lose 60 pounds. And uh, she smiled and, and said, you know, don't worry about it if, 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 if you can't do it. 
but I called my then girlfriend, now wife. Uh, she was in Italy with her mother on a trip I was supposed to be with, but I didn't sign up for the trip because I thought I was going to be have to retaking the Arizona bar, which I didn't. And I called her and said, uh, Sasha, I'm going to lose 60 pounds. And she laughed and hung up the phone. So sure enough, uh, six months later, 10 pounds a month, uh, I lost the 60 pounds. And I called the head lawyer at the base, the lieutenant colonel, and I said, I need to come see you for my interview. And she said, okay. And she said, by the way, you want to be what's called an IMA category B reservist. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the reserves, there's three different categories. And I wasn't familiar with this either. And most people you know probably won't be familiar with this. There's the traditional reservists, which we're all familiar with, the one weekend a month, two weeks a year reservists. Then there's the National Guard, which is also one week in a month, two weeks a year. And those individuals, they report, they're from all over. So we have them like we have at Papago Park in Phoenix. And so, you know, John from Tucson and Rodney from Las Vegas will drive one week in a month, two weeks a year to Papago Park and Rodney will write the wills and John will drive the tank. And then they do that one week in a month and then two weeks a year, they have an annual tour where they all go together somewhere or they get deployed. The third category, which is the one that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ashmore was her name, suggested was called the IMA Individual Mobilized Augmentee Category B. Never heard of it. No one had ever heard of it. But she said, I don't know much about it, but that's the most flexible. That's what all my friends do. And when she said that, I had no idea what she meant. But I said, that sounds good because I like flexibility. And so my entire application packet was designed around IMA Cat B. Didn't know what it meant, but it sounded good to me. Well, here I am. I lost 60 pounds. I'm feeling good. I'm getting ready for my interview. And this is the first time someone intervenes. I'm walking through a restaurant. Is anyone here from Tucson? Tucson background? No? Okay. One. Okay, Phyllis. So I'm walking through this restaurant in Tucson, and this couple grabs me. And they say, Councilman Glassman, you look great. You lost so much weight. We love your water policies because I did a lot with rainwater and gray water and solar power water heating when I was in Tucson. And they said, how did you lose all that weight? And I said, well, I want to be an IMA Cat B reservist in the U.S. Air Force JAG Corps Reserve. And I'm having an interview next week. And the man looks at me and says, you know, I was a JAG in the Air Force. And the wife says, and so was I. You should talk to our friend. He might be able to help you. And so I got all excited, sort of like when I met Levy on the side of the road and asked him to collect signatures for my wife. And uh, sure enough, I said, can I send you my resume? They said, yes. They said, we'll send you a phone number. You call our friend. He introduced us. We were all in the Air Force, and, and he's the reason we're married. And so I sent them my resume. They sent me back a phone number. Uh, and the fellow's name was uh, Lauren, L-O-R-E-N, Perlstein. Lauren Perlstein. And sure enough, I decided I would Google this fellow before I called him and I'll be damned because I didn't know a lot about the Air Force other than I wanted to be in it. This guy had his own website for the Air Force. Uh, his, and his name was Brigadier General Lauren Pearlstein. And so I called this fellow on the phone number and it happened to be his cell phone. And he said, uh, oh, I'm so excited to hear from you. The Hotchkiss has told me so much about you. You sound like just the kind of guy we need. Uh, but I have bad news. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't get to decide who gets in anymore. But I have good news. That guy works for me. Hold on a second. And he transfers me down the hall uh, to a colonel named Art Jackman at the time. And Art Jackman got on the phone. He said, General Perlstein has told me wonderful things about you. He said, so don't mail your application. This was 2009. So it was um, interesting times. He said, he said, don't mail it. He said, uh, finish it up, scan it, and send it in so we can look at it quicker. So I got my application done. The mayor of Tucson, other good friends had written me letters of reference, and I sent it in. That was on a Thursday. The following Tuesday, my phone rings, and it's Colonel Jackman, and he says, uh, Rodney, welcome to the Air Force. I said, this is wonderful. He says, You're gonna, we're going to send you a packet. You're going to have to go to Alabama for, for, nine week, for four weeks of officer training and nine weeks of JAG training. And uh, then you'll be ready to go and you'll be assigned at davis Mothin. It'll be great down in Tucson. Uh, we'll, this will be wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I hang up the phone. I'm all excited. 
And I, oh, I had to call him back. I called him back. I said, Colonel Jackman, who's now General Jackman. I said, uh, am I an IMA Cat B reservist? And he said, yes. And I said, what's that? And he explained that I would be the first JAG reservist with no legal experience and no military background to be assigned to an active duty office. And the theory was, if you think about it, the active duty JAG members rotate every two, two years. They get PCS, permanent change of station, where they go from base to base. And wouldn't it be wonderful for continuity if they had a reservist, someone who lived in the community, someone who understood the community, uh, someone who could, uh, they could train to do all the stuff that they need done, but who also might know the county attorney, might know people in the community, might be able to help the active duty members stay a little more connected. And so that's what happened. And it was 11 years ago that I got first assigned to Davis Mothin Air Force Base. And it was wonderful because our, our, my wife was pregnant with our first daughter. Um, and we've had just a, a number of crazy experiences in the Air Force. Uh, I was there on duty. Uh, Sasha, uh, my wife, was pregnant. And we had at the time, uh, because we, she was working in Phoenix uh, on her internship and, I, and we were still living in Tucson, we would go back and forth. Um, she had uh, an OBGYN in both places. And so I'll never forget, uh, it was time for her, uh, I was going to say inspection, but we have ladies on the phone. So I guess we have a checkup uh, for her checkup with our daughter. Uh, and it was November and uh, she had to go. And the doctor was concerned because uh, every time that she had uh, Braxton Hicks, uh, uh, the, the heart rate would drop. And so the doctor said, you need to go and get uh, the heart rate checked. So she was going to the hospital as our first daughter. And I, and I said, do you want me to go? And as I told you, I'm married to a Jewish attorney. So she said, don't worry about it. Stay at the Air Force Base. You keep working. I'll take care of this myself. And so I happened to be in uh, my active duty boss's office and make the comment to him that my wife was on her way to the hospital to get uh, our daughter's uh, heart, heartbeat checked. And uh, Colonel Williams, Colonel Andy Williams, uh, a wonderful LDS uh, Mormon boss uh, who had eight kids at the time looked at me and he goes, Captain Glassman, you need to go be with your wife right now. So off I went, just like in the movies, in my Air Force uniform to the hospital. And I go in and she's right, it was a decelerating heart rate. So every time there was a contraction, the heart rate would go down. Uh, the, her doctor walks in, she says, you, and I'm sitting there in full uniform, and she says, you have two choices when your daughter's five. She said, I want to do a cesarean. And she said, when your daughter's five, uh, I said, do we have to? She said, when your daughter's five, you can either push her through Disneyland or you can walk with her to Disneyland. Uh, it's up to you guys. And so obviously, uh, my, so it's crazy because even as a reservist, my, my, our first daughter was born uh, with me in a military uniform uh, on active orders uh, in Tucson, Arizona. And it gets crazier yet because the baby's born, the doc, uh, my boss knows the baby's born, he's all excited. And because I was the first direct accession into the JAG Corps, um, I didn't know much of what was going on. They had to train me. Well, I had gotten lucky, remember my roots in the LDS church as the assistant chaplain. One of my mentors in Tucson was also the president of the Tucson stake of the church which uh, if you're not familiar with the makeup of the church, um, the Catholics have the parish and the head of the parish is the priest. Well, the Mormons have the ward and the head of the ward is a bishop. Uh, in the Catholic religion, all the, war, all, the, uh, all the parishes roll up to the diocese and the head of the diocese is the cardinal. In the LDS faith and the Mormon faith, all of the wards roll up into what's called a stake. And my treasurer for my city council race happened to also be the president of the Tucson stake of the Mormon church. And so one day we're in his office after the baby's born and after Rose is born. And he says, uh, do you know a guy out at the air force base named Andy Williams? I said, Andy Williams. No, I don't know any Andy Williams. He says, there's, there's a fellow that goes to my church. His name's Andy Williams. And he, he's a lawyer out at the base. I go, Andy Williams, Andy Williams. I go, Colonel Williams. And Gary Rasmussen goes, yeah. I said, that, Gary, that's my boss. He said, well, next time you're there, you tell him President Rasmussen said hello. And sure enough, a couple weeks later, I'm there at the Air Force Base and I go in. I say, oh, I said, sir, I'm going to close the door. I close the door. I said, by the way, I'm supposed to tell you, President Rasmussen 
says hello. And for those of us in the Jewish faith, we know if anyone ever tells us that Rabbi Levi Levitov tells us hello, you know, we know the next thing is we have to do whatever they say, right? Because they, they're obviously friends with the rabbi. And believe it or not, as luck would have it, uh, this Colonel, Colonel Williams, he says, you know, Captain Glassman, uh, since you're new, we should really see if we can get you a few months of active duty orders so I can mentor you and teach you about court martials and teach you about litigation and really teach you about the Air Force. And so because of that strong connection between our faith um, and that of the church and these wonderful mentors that, uh, that I had from that connectivity, I was able to get uh, two months of active duty orders right out of the chute as a JAG reservist, which gave me the chance to, to litigate 11 court martials, uh, to do a lot of prosecuting, uh, to have such a great record in my first two years that I had the opportunity to be selected to go to squadron officer school, which is the professional military education between captain and major, which took place in Montgomery, Alabama. So because of that, uh, that that's just the interaction and that connection, we were off to Alabama two years later uh, from March uh, until May. Uh, Montgomery, Alabama is where all of the Air Force uh, education programs, other than basic training, uh, which is in Texas, uh, take place at Lackland Air Force Base. So at Maxwell Air Force Base, Montgomery, Alabama. And some of you may remember, I'm from Fresno, California. And so there we are. My wife is in her first trimester with our second daughter, Ruth. And don't ever go to Alabama with your wife in her first trimester. Not fun. But we were living in Prattville, Alabama. I think we were the only Jews in Prattville, Alabama. We had taken our Mormon nanny with us. She was staying with the Relief Society president, if you're familiar with the church. And there we were, and Passover came. So it was time to find a synagogue, right? So actually, it's interesting. The oldest synagogue in Alabama is in Montgomery, Alabama. And they had a wonderful open Seder where we could go. And so we took our daughter, Rose, and my wife, and we actually took another fellow that was in the course with us from Squadron Officer School, Jonathan Barber, uh, and we went. And it was the strangest thing ever because they didn't have a rabbi. And I have always, uh, and Levy knows this, uh, while I love rabbis, I'm more of a cantor guy. I like to sing. And so in Levy's house, you walk in and there's the Rebbe. If you walk into our house, he always rolls his eyes because I actually have a picture of my bar mitzvah cantor hanging in my living room, uh, actually in my dining room, much to my wife's chagrin, but uh, cantor Loring was wonderful. My mother found it, so I have it. And so sure enough, but I've always been acutely aware of the rabbis because the rabbis are the ones that build the temples, right? In Fresno, California, I remember when I got my bar mitzvah, I studied with the cantor, but the rabbi, uh, Ken Siegel uh, was his name. Uh, built a new uh, synagogue in a uh, new temple in Fresno, and then he actually moved to Phoenix. Uh, so for those of you that remember the old rabbi at CBI, a guy named Ken Siegel, um, he's the one that built the new building, Robin's shaking her head. And, uh, and so sure enough, um, there uh, we, we have the new synagogue we go to now, now an old synagogue, but once again, built by Rabbi Ken Siegel. So my parents used to joke, they called him the great temple builder because everywhere Ken Siegel went, he built a temple, right? And so sure enough, we go to this uh, open Seder in Montgomery, Alabama, and they have no rabbi. Crazy. And I said, well, what happened to your rabbi? And they said, well, he was a wonderful guy, but he left. I said, why do you leave? They said, well, he wanted us to build a new building, and we just didn't want to build a new building, so he left. I said, well, what was his name? Any guesses? Ken Siegel. So we missed him by one there, but it's fun, crazy just Air Force stories all the way around. And so sure enough, we, we missed Rabbi Siegel, but we had a wonderful uh, Seder in Montgomery, Alabama at the, at the Rabbi List Temple. And we remember the Bethel at the time. Uh, we only had the one daughter, but sure enough. Um, but we always call Levy for our important Jewish questions. He knows that when it's time to hang our mezuzahs. We call Rabbi Levitov, always the best. And so sure enough, um, because of these wonderful experiences that I had, a lot of litigation, getting to go to squadron officer school, I then started getting selected for special projects. So because of the Air Force JAG Corps, I've actually been uh, to Denmark um, up with, with, the, with the Air Force. I've been to Germany twice. Um, and each time that I have been on these trips, it's been a wonderful opportunity to also learn more, get a little bit more engaged in our faith. When I was uh, in Denmark on that trip, 
um, I was at a, a, a Danish Air Force Base uh, called Garup Air Force Base, K-A-R-U-P. And what was interesting about it is this Danish uh, Air Force Base used to be a Nazi Air Force Base uh, during World War II. And we went to the officers club there, they actually had a piece of the original floor with the swastikas in the officers club covered with glass. And so it's just been very uh, interesting and a real blessing for me uh, to get the opportunity uh, to have these experiences. But also a lot of what we do in the legal community involves other countries as well. And so because of that experience and because I was there and got to know some of the German Air Force members, uh, they then invited me the following year uh, to participate uh, in their program that they were hosting uh, at another Air Force base called Kochbern. Kochbern Air Force Base uh, is outside of Munich, about 45 minutes. And Kochbern Air Force Base is interesting because it was a German Air Force Base, excuse me, it was a Nazi Air Force Base that became a US Air Force Base and is now a German Air Force Base. And so once again, uh, just a tremendous amount of history from World War II, a tremendous amount of history. Um, and uh, I have been asked because I do enjoy singing, uh, I've had the opportunity to often uh, provide the invocation. Uh, and so, uh, so I've, I've literally sang Shalom Rav all over Europe uh, because uh, of my Air Force experiences. And it's wonderful because uh, while, as you heard from the story, there's, you know, there are a lot of connections with Jewish people. Uh, General Goldfein, who just uh, finished as a chief of staff for the Air Force, was Jewish as well. Um, and then actually the, the head JAG, the T-JAG, when I joined, that actually had to sign the approval from the General Pearlstein was a fellow named Jack Rives. Jack Rives was the T-JAG, also Jewish, now the uh, CEO of the American Bar Association in Chicago and someone else that I still keep in touch with. So there's just a tremendous kind of very interesting line tying the experiences of being connected with the Jewish faith uh, to uh, our Jewish community, to the LDS community and to the issue of, of really service, uh, which has been uh, tremendous and wonderful and uh, something that has provided not only me, but my family and my daughters uh, with just great experiences, great experiences all around the world, uh, contributing uh, alongside the active duty men and women, uh, all because we all uh, just stayed connected and, and were interested in, in continuing to answer the call uh, when uh, service was something that I could do. And so it, it's been a blast and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share it all with you. Um, I'm always interested in trying to help other people that are interested in joining the Air Force uh, to join. Um, so there's opportunities to, to get interviews. There's opportunity to be, if you're not a lawyer, there's opportunity to be paralegals, which is a great thing for kids that want to go to law school or frankly want to do anything because you can join as a paralegal um, without a degree. And while you're going to college, you're already a veteran. You can check that box. You can do some service. And then when you want to apply uh, to the JAG Corps, you can move on over. So it's, it's very welcoming. It's been very welcoming. It's been very wonderful. And one last thing I will share, just because it's important to stay connected to your cantors, my cantor that married us, uh, Cantor Lichterman, uh, who had a twin brother named Joel, uh, who's a cantor in Denver. Um, their father was the last cantor in Warsaw. And when I was going to school in Tucson, uh, I, because I sang, uh, he grabbed me when I was 19 years old and made me join the choir. And he offered me free food. So I celebrated every Jewish holiday from undergrad uh, till the day I got engaged to my Jewish wife uh, with the Lichtermans. And when I got engaged, he called me and he said, Rodney, now you can go to Sasha's families and celebrate with them. But uh, so when we went on that, uh, the, the second trip to Germany, um, I was with a buddy who wasn't Jewish, but I made sure to call Cantor Lichterman, who's now uh, in Ohio. Uh, and he's, as, uh, he's in the happiest place any cantor could be, which is a synagogue with no rabbi. So he gets to do both. And uh, I said, Cantor, I said, I'm in Germany. What should we see while we're here? And we were driving, uh, we drove to Prague, we drove to Budapest, uh, and we drove to Vienna. And it was just wonderful because you always need to call these rabbis like Rabbi Levitov, because they give you the best advice. And we were in Prague, we saw the Spanish synagogue, we saw the oldest synagogue in Prague, actually the oldest synagogue in Europe, which is in Prague. 
uh, my poor buddy I kept having getting the Catholic kid from the Cuban Catholic from Miami kept getting dragged to all the synagogues. And then when we got to Budapest, we got to see the grand synagogue, the one that was uh, refurbished by Ron Lauder who was our speaker a couple of years ago at the Jewish National Fund breakfast. That's why we got him to be the speaker because I remember seeing the synagogue and my wife and I were co-chairing it that year. So we asked if he could come out. And then the most wonderful experience that we had was in Vienna because there is only one synagogue left from Kristallnacht in Vienna. Uh, it was in a row of, of a residential area where it couldn't be destroyed. And it was the synagogue where all of the melodies that Cantor Lichterman in Tucson and his father uh, taught uh, where our choir sang. It was where all those melodies came from. And we got so lucky, we pulled in at four o'clock on a Friday and once a month, the men's choir, cause it's Orthodox, the men's choir there uh, would do a whole service. And so I got to go to uh, the only surviving synagogue in Vienna uh, and hear a wonderful men's choir perform all of the songs, all the prayers that I grew up with as an undergrad all the way through grad school in Tucson, uh, all because uh, I uh, signed up 11 years ago and raised my hand and became a member of the United States Air Force JAG Corps Reserve. So it's been wonderfully, I always say other than my, other than my, my wife and kids, it's, it's, it's the next best thing that I've always enjoyed doing in my life. And uh, it's a wonderful, I like sharing the story and so I appreciate I love you inviting me and I appreciate all of you indulging me with the opportunity to share it. So um, Rodney, thank you very much. And a question before we open it up to others for questions. What is the typical legal um, work that you find that most JAGs are occupied with? So the JAG Corps uh, really is, uh, it, it's one legal system. So we do everything. So I do, we do court, well, in the active duty and this is what I do too, we do court martials, so we try the cases, we prosecute. Uh, the, the military law is ran under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's a separate set of laws that are written by Congress. Uh, many of the laws are the same, some of them are different. We have DUIs, civilian, we have DUIs in the military. The military has something called adultery. Uh, that's against the law in the military. Um, dishonorable failure to pay your debts, that is against the law in the military. So a lot of it has to do with uh, a good, uh, good order and discipline, but we do uh, environmental law, we do contracts. You think about any kind of service that gets provided by the military bases. Um, you know, when, the, when you're sick and you call and there's an 800 number and they triage you before sending you to a doctor, that company gets a contract with the military. So it's a procurement issue. So if they want to appeal it, that has to go through the legal office as well. So it's everything with COVID. Um, the, I'm now assigned to Ielsen Air Force Base which is outside of Fairbanks. And one of the defense attorneys got COVID. So they had to close down the legal offices because everyone interacts with each other. So, uh, you know, just back in March, I was doing work to design the decision-making template for the wing commander, the Colonel on what he could do and how he could do it based on, can you shut down the base? Can you close the office? Can you make people wear masks? Can you, what can you do? So all of that, the department of defense uh, and the air force instructions, everything goes to the legal office. Just think about all the different ways that a company would use their, their general counsel, same thing for, for our lawyers at the Air Force bases. Awesome, thank you. Um, anyone have any questions for Rodney? First of all, thank you very much. And I know before you do hang up, um, I'd love for you to talk about the county assessor thing, which is not what we brought you on, but it is obviously a current topic. Um, but first, if anyone has questions, um, Ellen, did you have a question? Yeah, well, a little comment. Uh, we have a little connection. My son was also the only Jewish child in a LDS troop at 30, Shea in 36. So I don't know if you know that big church there. Yeah. Okay, and when we went to the Blue and Gold dinner for the first time, somebody came up to me and says, Sister Ellen, we haven't seen you in church. You must be new. And I had to tell them I'm the token Jew. <laughs> No, and, and the, the I didn't say that. I think I just said I was in, in, brought in by a friend, a neighbor, but we're not LDS. You mean you're not, you're supposed to say you're not LDS yet. That's what they like to hear. Oh. But, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, it's so, it's just a, it's a wonderful, our experience has been just a wonderful faith. Um, in fact, it's funny because uh, I remember when the missionaries came to my house uh, when I was, I think, 12. Uh, cause we'd been to Salt Lake and we'd filled out the postcard. And so they came to pitch us by the time, and Levy knows my mother, but by the time they were vi done visiting with my mother, it was a Friday night. We were there for synagogue. I turned around and looked behind me. My mother had gotten the missionaries to go to synagogue. That's how uh, <laughs> persuasive she was. 
I don't know if they ever converted, but they say that the, the Mormons are the only ones that can call Jews Gentiles. Um, <laughs> we'll have not figured out what that means or what that's all about, but I just, I like that because- uh, well, they, were very, they were very kind. And my neighbor said to me when we had a barbecue, you better bring your own hot dogs because I know that the ones they use have pork in them. Well, and, and it's funny though, because, it, and Levy asked about the campaign and your comment, um, mm -hmm. the chair of my campaign for Maricopa County Assessor is a fellow named Leroy Breinholt. Leroy Breinholt uh, is LDS. So we're getting a lot of support from the LDS community, but Leroy also, if you ever drive around town and you see all those uh, for rent signs that say commercial properties incorporated, CPI, they're everywhere. And now that I've told you about it, you'll see them everywhere. Uh, that's Leroy Breinholt and his brother Tyson who own that company. So we've been receiving a ton of great support uh, from business people, across the community, Jewish ones like Steve Hilton and Andrew Cohn, and uh, also uh, a lot of LDS people, uh, just because our, 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 our faith, yeah. our faith are, are both so, so tied to education and family uh, that it really uh, makes a wonderful connection. But you asked about, Levy, you asked about the campaign, so real briefly. Before that, before okay. that, I want to make sure, that, I do want to get you that. Phyllis, you want to ask a question? I want to make I sure your battery lasts, Rodney. I just want to say, Rodney, my husband and I wish you the very best on your run for county assessor. You've Thank been you. to Prescott. We live in Prescott. You've oh, yes, Prescott. yes. Or well. And uh, the last time you were up here, you were at our ARWAP meeting. Yes. And you sang Shalom Rav. And I want you to know <laughs> that I was sitting with, there's, we have a table of Jews at the Republican. No, no, there's a ton of Jews in Prescott. And they, yeah. all, love, they all love Seymour Wright. And yes. So we were, we were sitting there, and when you sang that, I, we all had tears. It was so beautiful. So I just wanted you to know that, and the best to you on your campaign. Well, thank you very much. I remember I wasn't even, actually I was, I was, I think I had just decided to run for county assessor, and there's actually a, a friend of mine named Josh Meyer, whose family's from Yuma. His dad's a doctor, but his brother lived in, uh, in Tucson. And right after we left the ARWAT meeting, uh, we went and picked up, uh, I'll never forget it because we picked up 2,500 bucks from him. And the funny thing is he's a Democrat. He's, this is the first time I've ever written a check to a Republican. <laughs> Another Great. Jewish guy. Hold on. Hold, give me, give me 10 seconds. I'm going to plug this in. Hold on. Oh, now I know Rodney's enjoying this because he's plugging oh. in his laptop. <laughs> oh, I just want to ask a, say a comment if I can. Sure. Give me one, give him one second. He won't hear you. Yeah, no, I know. I just want to. Uh, Rodney. Rodney. Back. I, I, I'm Jeff Ballin's mom. So oh, I so what, when I saw you, you know, I was wondering about that. Yeah, well, I just want to thank you. Years ago, when he told me he came to your office and you mentored him, and I really do appreciate your trying to have helped him, you know, Jag, whatever, su whatever suggestions that you he may or may not have listened, you know. The only, that's, the only that's, problem with Robin's son is he's too honest. Uh, can I share? Yeah, you can share. Yeah, I'll share. So, so Jeff uh, married a beautiful gal named Laura, who's in who was a, a, a council intern when I was on the city council, and he went to law school and he's done really well. And, and for a while there, he was one of my running buddies. He lived down the street, yes. and he said he wanted to join the Air Force JAG Corps, and so. I said, okay. And so we got him the interview and this, that, and the other thing. And I think what happened, I don't, I don't remember the, the whole incident. I just remember for a brief moment, he ended up in the hospital for less than 24 hours. And one of the damn questions on the medical thing is, have you ever had a concussion or something like that? Oh my goodness. And, okay. And, yes. and he, and he um, uh, or, or amongst family, he stupidly was honest about it and it tripped him up on the damn medical thing. Because oh, of, is that what happened? I was wondering because he, never he was told his mother what he, Yeah, and we kept yeah. waiting and waiting and waiting. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, well, don't tell him I told. <laughs> don't tell him I told you because I'm probably breaking some <laughs> sort of law. But, it, no. but at, the, at the end of the day, it was it was the honesty that you taught him that got him all screwed up. But that's an no. okay. <laughs> it's an okay thing. But yeah, no, you have a wonderful and a wonderful family, and I still keep in touch with your daughter-in-law and everyone. Yeah. They're, they're great. Yeah, he's he, yeah. just a very sweet son. And that high, high, yeah, and that high chair lasted for both children, by the way. It's funny. You can pass on high chairs. We learned after the second one, you're not supposed to pass on car seats. So we stopped doing that. <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't have any accidents in the middle. Yeah. Elaine, nice to see you. did you have a question, Elaine? 
Oh, uh, first of all, do you know Ted Court? Yes. Well, our daughter married his son. Okay, okay. But I have another thing to tell you. Our son, when he was in undergraduate school, was got accepted to U of A Medical School. And he wanted to join the Air Force. He was hoping they would pay for his uh, education. It, it, he wanted to be a flight surgeon. Okay. And he went through weeks and weeks of testing and passed everything. And the very last test was he was colorblind. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they do that the first? That's the simplest <laughs> test. I have no idea, but I'll tell you, I had a similar situation when I was going through my medical entrance processing service oh. exam. Um, I failed the eye part. It failed in the sense that I didn't have 20-20 vision. I remember calling and asking, is that going to be a problem? And the response was, we're hiring you to be a lawyer, not a pilot. You're fine. Okay. And uh, no, they have, it, it's, it's a, it, I think people forget, and obviously your son learned the hard way. I think for a lot of people, they don't realize that, um, you know, serving in the military is a privilege. It's not it's not a right. And the standards that we have, be it, you know, and we, we see the best yeah. because we're the lawyers, but we also, you know, see the worst. The, la the last time I was doing duty was uh, three weeks ago. I was at a Luke Air Force Base for one day because they needed a field grade officer and I'm a major to oversee a, uh, a deposition mm -hmm. as, the, as the deposition officer, you know, of a double rape. Um, and so we see the best and the worst, and but it's, it's, uh, yeah, no, it, it's, I, I, I tell everyone that can uh, and who will listen um, that if their kids have an opportunity to join the military, or their kids have an opportunity to go to one of the service academies, mm -hmm. um, that it's, it's kind of like getting your Eagle Scout. It's just one of those things yeah. that they can't take away from you. And no matter what else you want to do. So where's, is your, is your son, where's he a doctor at now? Well, he was here at Banner for uh, about eight years and now he's, um, he's, he's Oh, I forget what he is. Anyway, he he's working for a medical um, pharmaceutical. Oh, cool. Uh, company. So. Very nice. And he he just moved up to Flagstaff, but his he, they have a place in Tucson. So he's okay. in Flag for the summer at not Tucson, excuse me, Sedona. Oh, so, Sedona and uh, Sedona and Flag. That's not, that's not bad. Yeah. So um, anyway. Bobby. Um, Rena had a question that she wrote in the chat that I'll read to you. She, wrote, she asked, "It will running for office would it affect your uh, military career if you won?" No, it it, it will not. Uh, if anything, maybe if I get elected, it'll help me get a better assignment uh, in the sense that I won't have to fly all the way to Alaska. Um, all those nice TDYs I told you about to Denmark and Germany and Germany. Uh, someone at the Pentagon. Uh, realized I had been assigned in Tucson. I had been assigned at, uh, in, at Luke in Phoenix, uh, but and I had been going on lots of cool trips. And so they decided I needed to go to Alaska next. So I've been in Alaska now for two, two and a half years. And it's been great. My, my, my kids have been up during, in fact, until recently when we were at Rainbow Lake in Pine Top, the only place my daughters had ever caught fish was in the North Pole, Alaska because Eielson Air Force Base is where the North Pole, uh, the town is. And when we went up the first time, two years ago, we stayed on a lake. And so they got to fish for the first time ever on this lake. And then last January, right all, before all the COVID stuff, um, I flew them up for the first four days of my two weeks up there. And, uh, and they got to ice fish, um, but it was funny because they literally caught fish on the same lake. Just this time it was negative 35. Um, but other than that, uh, one of the nice things about being an IMA Cat B is that there's tremendous flexibility. And so um, what I do is I make sure that I get my days done, but it can be going down to Tucson. They have the Air Operations Center, which is uh, a part of Davis Mothin, but it's where we track all the planes that are flying in South America. They need JAGs there. That's a secure, secure facility. So most people that go to DM don't even, I, I, was, I was assigned for five years there and didn't even know it existed. Um, but so I can serve down there because of my clearance. I can, you know, I can go to Luke and do the one-offs. So it actually would enhance my military service in the sense that one of the things as a reservist that they like us to be able to do is to open doors for the active duty members and to raise the profile of the military, given that, you know, less than one half of 1% of all Americans now are serving um, for, for us to have more people in service and also in community service is actually a good thing. So it, it, it doesn't impact, it won't impact in a negative way. It could potentially, 
enhanced slightly, but mostly it, it's, it's just uh, it's irrelevant to it. All right, next question was, why do you want to be the county assessor? I have uh, what's called a servant's heart. Um, it, it started with the Boy Scouts, started with the, you know, the, the Eagle Scout project where I you know, built an eight foot tall menorah out of copper and brass, you know, with all my Sunday school classmates, the only, only scouting thing most of them ever did. Um, I like community service and, and, and years ago, a mentor uh, told me that uh, if you like community service and, and it fits with your family, aligns with your skill set, and is a place you can make a difference, then you should consider running for it. And so I was, I ran, for some of you might know, I ran for corporation commission in 2018 because my PhD in water, I lost by 4,000 votes out of 4.2 million votes, less than one tenth of 1% uh, to a gal named Kennedy. And uh, sure enough, um, I was planning on running for corporation commission again. And it was during my initial exploration of that, that I was asked to run for county assessor. Um, the, the prior assessor had been indicted for human trafficking. You may have seen that in the news. And the assessor's role is a very important one because I assume everyone uh, either owns or has owned their home before. Um, every February, you get a postcard in the mail from the county assessor that is your assessed value. What happens then is six months later in June, the board of supervisors and the school boards and the city councils, they get together and unlike any of us where we set our budget based on what we know we can spend, the way government works is the opposite. They set their budget based on what they wanna spend and then they work backwards. They take their budget called the levy, they divide that levy by the value of all those postcards that get sent out in February for that particular jurisdiction and that's how they decide the tax rate. So they actually set the rate after they know how much they wanna raise or take from us. And so the reason I was asked to run for assessor is because historically the assessor's office has just been a rubber stamp. Think about it. Every Last year your taxes went up, right? And the year before your taxes went up, right? And the year before that your taxes went up, right? And even when property values went down, your taxes went up, right? Right. You've never had anyone in the whole process as an elected official say, hey, I'm gonna work to fight to get our taxes lower. Because as you heard that whole process, the postcards go out in February and then they set the budget in June. Oh, you don't get the bill till next October. So none of us know how any of this works. And so the idea was why not have someone with a background in real estate? I've got 20 years of real estate and law background now. Why not have someone like us with the, with, we'll use the word chutzpah since there's ladies on the phone, you know, with a chutzpah to just stand up on behalf of taxpayers and say, hey, when the property value goes up, the rate should go down because the game they play right now, and there was an article about it in the newspaper that I wrote the other day, when the value goes up, the guys that set the rate, they say, oh, we're gonna keep the rate the same. We're gonna do you a favor by keeping your tax rate the same. We'll do the math. If the rate stays the same and the value goes up, what happens to our bills? They go up every year, but we don't know who to blame because they kept the rate the same. Well, the rate shouldn't stay the same. The rate should go down when the value goes up. And that's my whole campaign platform is how about voting for someone that actually is gonna fight for lower taxes. Um, you know, it, it requires the rate setters to lower the rate, but no one's ever asked them before. And so that's why I'm running. It's a great office. It's uh, when I was asked, the question was, um, would you mind running for something that's not statewide? Can your ego handle it? And I said, you know, I, I don't run for office because of my ego, I run because I wanna serve. So the assessor's office is actually great because I can make a difference. I can stay close to my family. Once we start basketball again, I like coaching the girls basketball. You know, I like being around, I like swimming with them. I, my number one favorite thing to do is be a father. And I do enjoy my Air Force duty too. So having a locally elected office that allows me to make a difference for all of us and also enjoy my kids and enjoy my wife and enjoy my life while also doing community service and working full time is a great thing. So that, that's why I'm running for county assessor. And I think we're doing well because my opponent has spent $143,000 of his own money attacking me. Uh, and what he likes to attack is the fact that a decade ago when I was in law school, um, I was a Democrat in Tucson. And so he loves to attack that. And so he's literally spending 
you know, over a hundred thousand dollars of his own money. Plus I think he has eight donors. Um, and they, all the money's going down the toilet, uh, talking about me from a decade ago. And I'm busy talking about how I'm going to work to try to get our taxes lower. So that's my campaign yeah. in a nutshell. On that note, someone did ask, um, why are you running as a Republican in the chat? So you might as well answer the 10 year difference to what changed, I guess. Well, so I, I did, it's more Jewishness. Um, I moved to Tucson when I was 19. I, was, I grew up in Fresno. Fresno is very conservative. I grew up in a Republican household and I moved to Tucson at age 19. And the mayor of Tucson at the time was a fellow named George Miller. May he rest in peace. And George said, if you're going to be involved in this, Tucson was a great place 20 years ago. You could actually sit down and like have a conversation with the mayor in his office about your party. And he said, if you're going to be involved in this community, you need to be a Democrat. So when I was 19, I went from Republican to independent to Democrat. And I stayed a Democrat. And I, when I worked for the home building industry, I was worth the chief of staff for KB Homes. I was a Democrat. When I worked for Congressman Grijalva, I was a Democrat. When I was on the board of the JCC, I was a Democrat. When I ran for city council, I was a Democrat. Um, if, if anyone got screwed in this equation, it's my beautiful wife, because she still is a Democrat. And uh, so sure enough, you know, life went on and I ran for office and I got elected and then I ran again and I didn't get elected. And then we moved to Phoenix and we had our first daughter and we had our second daughter and I served in the Air Force for a long time. And about six years ago, I was in Maui uh, and ran into a friend from, from Phoenix and we're sitting there and he asked me a question that no one had ever asked me before. Cause I have a lot of friends that are business guys in town that are Republicans. And for the longest time, they always used to say, why aren't, why aren't you Republican? Why aren't you Republican? Why aren't you Republican? And I, um, you know, uh, um, but I got asked a very different question. And the question was, why are you a Democrat? And I said, well, because George Miller told me when I was nine, you know, I told him, but here I am sitting, I'm 35, 36. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a, ma I'm a major in the Air Force. Um, and, and, and I, well, the mayor told me when I was 19, didn't sound quite as compelling. Um, no one had ever asked that. So then he asked the second question. So what do you care about most? And without thinking about it, without trying to be political, I go, well, Israel defense and taxes. And now that you heard my story, you know why I have a beautiful Jewish wife and two beautiful Jewish girls. And my number one issue is the Jewish state of Israel. My number two issue is defense. Why? Cause I live it. And my number three issue is taxes because I'm a fiscal conservative and I do well and I like to, and I'm very philanthropic with the Jewish community and the Boy Scouts and the, the charter school where our daughters go and my wife serves on the board, but I like making those decisions myself. And so I said, Israel defense and taxes. And the guy looked at me and he goes, you're a Republican. And I said, I, maybe I am. And so I very quietly six years ago without you know any fanfare or press releases or anything else, I just changed because I'd, I'd literally gotten to the point where the only people that were giving me a hard time for being a Democrat were the Democrats because I wasn't a good Democrat. You know, I had friends that were Republican. I had friends that were Democrat. I, I am friends with people and I support people. And, uh, and so we had our lifestyle and so we changed. I changed. My wife's still a, a Democrat and active and she writes her checks and I write my checks. And, but we agree when it comes to our priorities, which are faith, family. And, uh, and so that, that is where we sit. And uh, so I'm proud, but I'll tell you, there's a, there's a movement going around uh, right now, which is fascinating, uh, called the walkaway movement. I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but it's, it's uh, people that were Democrats that became Republicans. And what's fascinating, if you go to my website, which is rodneyglassman.com, um, you'll see my endorsements. And I have like really um, uh, great endorsements from lifelong Republicans, um, not necessarily because they believe in everything that I believe in. But if you think about it, I uh, like Congressman Gosar. Congressman Gosar is like a super conservative dude, right? Phyllis is clapping. Others of you maybe think he's terrible. Who knows? Um, but he's a dentist. My mother was a dentist. But most importantly, if, if you care about Israel, he's a champion for the Jewish state of Israel. If you care about defense, he's a champion for defense. And if you care about low taxes, he, you know, he, he votes, you know, the party line and is an advocate for low taxes. And so, so it just depends, um, you know, Governor Brewer, a big supporter of mine. So that's why this campaign has been so funny, because if you think about it, um, I'm running against a guy who literally is trashing me for having joined his party. I talk about low taxes. He talks about how I used to be a Democrat. I talk about property values. He talks about how I used to be a Democrat. And so it's a really weird 
deal because I think most of the people that support me, in fact, a lot of endorsements that I have in Phyllis is from up in Yavapai County, but the, the president of the Arizona State Senate, a woman named Karen Fan. President Karen Fan, when I was on the Tucson City Council as a Democrat, she was the mayor of Chino Valley. When my wife and I ran the license plate bill, if you ever see those uh, license plates with the apple that says support our schools, uh, that was a project that my wife and I did. When we did that as volunteers, Karen Fan was the chair of the House Transportation Committee and all the license plate bills go through transportation. When I was the town manager of Cave Creek, she was a state legislator from Legislative District 1, which represents Cave Creek. In fact, every parade my daughters have ever been in was with Karen Fan. We call her Aunt Karen because it just, she's been someone who's been with us you know, throughout, you know, in my entire adult life, but most of the people that are supporting me now for county assessor as a Republican knew me more than 10 years ago when I was a Democrat. They, they're more concerned about who's going to be protecting taxpayers than they are about our party affiliation. And so I'm excited. The election's next Tuesday. Today's the last day to turn in your mail-in ballot. If you're an independent, you can ask for a Republican ballot. Vote Glassman. Uh, some people are cutting off my signs. So if you see a sign for ass man, because there's no G and L, that is also one of my signs. So keep track of that too. Uh, Glassman or Assman, vote Glassman for low taxes. All right, Thank quick. Uh, Rhea was waiting patiently to ask you a question. Rhea, do you want to? Oh, sure, that's okay. My daughter had an experience with uh, the Air Force. She joined uh, actually in about 2003. Uh, while she was in training, she had some sort of a slight medical problem, uh, and she called me up from the office and said, well, they gave me a choice. I can either have a treatment or I can just discharge out. And she said, I think it's a sign from God, Mom. I'm supposed to go to U of A and become a teacher. So I was very happy. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, but that was, that was her experience. So... I'm going to get a little serious on you. You obviously have had some very good experiences from childhood, uh, being accepted into other cultures in our society and in the military. Um, how do you look at anti-Semitism on the rise right now and racial inequities? And how do you look at our leadership as my opinion, not denouncing it enough. I, uh, well, what I'll talk about first is I'll talk about uh, the issue of anti-Semitism. And one of the things that uh, my campaign guys go nuts uh, is I always talk about Israel. I always talk about Jewish. I always talk about the Jewish state of Israel. And whenever I use the word Israel, I call it the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, and it drives some people crazy because I'm you know, usually when you're campaigning, you only get a certain number of words. And I always put Jewish state of before Israel drives them nuts. But I think that uh, one of the most important things uh, that we can do uh, as, as Jewish people uh, is uh, be proud of our Judaism and highlight our Judaism. Um, Levy knows this, I'm, you know, I'm either calling him or asking him uh, for advice on what do you do about this? What do you do about that? And where can I perform? And where can I sing? Where can I demonstrate how Jewish I am? Uh, because I just think that getting more people engaged and understanding the Jewish community and what we are and what our faith is about, what our beliefs are about. Um, that's why I've, 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 my wife and I have chaired the Jewish National Fund breakfast multiple times. You know, I usually fill eight to 10 tables when we do, uh, just because we invite everybody to learn about um, Israel and learn about our, our community. And so, so from that perspective, I think one of the things that, that I've been able to do uh, is push back. Um, a couple years ago, it was in the news, um, someone uh, made a meme, which is where you can type in the different words that, 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 that you want the actor to say. Uh, Samuel Jackson had that movie, Snakes on a Plane. You could type in, you wanted to talk about something and it would come out his voice. And there's another one called Fallen feature. It was Adolf Hitler uh, in the bunker talking about this and talking about that. And, uh, another fellow uh, who was a lobbyist um, had made a very nasty video about me and my wife about my children's books, about me running for office and this and that. And he had sent it to just a few of his friends who in turn, who had sent it to a few more of their friends who had in turn sent it to my boss at my old law firm. And rather than just sit quietly, you know, I stood up because I think that one of the things that's nice and whether it's about being in the Air Force or whether it's about being accepted or whether it's about being, having means or working in the business community is it puts me in a position to be able to stand up for people of our faith uh, because not everyone does. Not everyone's in a, in a place to do that. 
And so that's something that I do personally. It's something that I'm te- my wife and I are teaching our daughters to make sure uh, that they do as well. And that I think is just, it's just so important to teach other people about what, what we do. And that's one of the unfortunate things, frankly, about COVID. Um, you know, we were just talking about yesterday. We can't have a Hanukkah party this year with everyone because normally we like to do that and bring our friends in and educate them on our faith and what it's all about. And so there are going to be a lot of lost opportunities. We need to figure out what we can do individually with, with our, you know, through, through other forms of communication to make sure people understand. Um, I am, a, you know, just to be candid, I'm a, I'm a supporter of the president. I'm a supporter of President Trump. And, and I'll tell you, um, the reason I'm a supporter of him and Bella's leaning back and she's disgusted, he has Jewish grandkids. And that's a matter of fact. And so whether uh, he's a staunch supporter of Israel because he's a staunch supporter of Israel or he's a staunch supporter of Israel simply because he cares about protecting his own lineage, whether it's a self-serving or whether he's an advocate, either way, when it comes to my number one issue, he's there, he, he's there in a good way. Um, the, the kindest, most articulate president of our lifetime was the one that I believe gave billions of dollars to Iran. Uh, the one who probably speaks inappropriately sometimes and presents himself not in the best of ways and probably could do a lot of things better is the one that I support currently and that I'll be voting for. Um, and it's the one with the Jewish grandkids. So I, I, I get, I get ner- because you know my background, and because you know, I have tremendous friends that are Democrats and tremendous friends. Well, in fact, my opponent was was uh, my opponent literally was posting on Facebook that the reason I can't be trusted as county assessor is because I sleep with a Democrat. My wife, but that like that's how disgusting politics has gotten. That it, it's about stupid things like that, and so I don't allow myself to get dragged down into that. I can't defend, nor do I need to defend everything that this president does or that president does. Uh, for me, you know, I, I'm very strong in my core beliefs, which is Israel defense and taxes, and he's doing pretty good on that. So could we always have uh, leaders who do more? Yes. Um, and that's frankly why I think, you know, Levy and, and his family and the things that they do a Smile on Seniors and a lot of the other things that they're doing in the community are just so important because uh, we are not all, in every community, you know, we need to have, I, I worked for the most liberal member of Congress when I was in Tucson, uh, Raul Grijalva. And now I'm supported by, you know, Jan Brewer and Paul Gosar. So you could, you could argue I've kind of, I've been full spectrum and we need all of that because I am not in a position uh, or in a place in life with my two daughters to make any of the sacrifices or, or, or as, as many of the sacrifices as Levy and his family are uh, to represent our faith out in the community. Um, and I think that's wonderful. I also uh, think that, uh, you know, our, my old rabbi at, uh, at uh, Bethel, who's very conservative, was wonderful. I also think one of the kindest rabbis we have in, in Phoenix is Rabbi Linder. Uh, in fact, uh, if you know Rabbi Linder, um, when, that, uh, when that meme was made with the nasty uh, the Hitler video, uh, Rabbi Linder was the first person to call me. And we had lunch, and it was funny because I have my Tucson roots. And the nicest rabbi in Tucson uh, uh, was a, a rabbi, is a rabbi named Tom Lochheim. Very, very sweet rabbi. He's just like, just the nicest man you'll ever meet. And I was telling Rabbi Linder, who's obviously very sweet, uh, about this nice rabbi named Tom Lochheim from uh, Tucson. And Linder goes, uh, you know, we went to summer camp together. So somewhere back east is the summer camp where they make out, no offense, Levy, where they make the really, really sweet rabbis. Um, and Rabbi Linder went to that one too. So I just think it's important for us to, you know, support the Jewish Community Relations Council, to do those different kinds of things that we can do as Jews, but most importantly, to not only be involved in our faith, but be proud of our faith and highlight that we are engaged in our faith to others. And I think that's what we can do individually um, to help uh, combat anti-Semitism and uh, racial injustices in any form. All right, last, uh, unless Ria has a follow-up to that, do you? No, um, so last question that I have for you, and this is a question that someone asked me, they wanted to know if you do the, um, Stephen, hold on, Stephen Richards rendition of Shalom Rob, 
I only know the one that Cantor Loring did. I don't know what it's called, but it's a Shalom Rav al Yisrael Amcha Tasim Leolam Shalom Rav al Yisrael Amcha Tasim Leolam Ki Ata Hu Melech Adon Lechal HaShalom Ki Ata Hu Melech Adon Lechal HaShalom V'Torah V'Etecha Levarech Et Amcha Yisrael Mechal Etu V'Chal Shah Mishlomecha Baruch Atadonai Oseh Shalom. That was beautiful. Sharon, did you want to say something? I just wanted to thank you so much for all of your explanations. I love the reason that you're running for Maricopa County Assessor. It's for all the right reasons. And it's very refreshing to, to hear somebody truly speak from their heart regarding everything you've done in your life. And I just want to say thank you. I'm so sorry. I left the board of JMF just as you were becoming involved. I was on the board for close to 10 years. So I know all the same people you do. I love being on that board. And I love what we do and all the trips that we made to Israel and everything I learned. And I love your explanation for being a Republican. We're aligned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, I know the, the JNF board is, is is the most wonderful. You know, Ted Court had done. In fact, I, the the first breakfast I went to before I uh, became co chair was the last breakfast that Ted did, mm -hmm. and it was wonderful. And uh, Beth Jo Zeitzer was honored, and uh, it was uh, actually it's, it was uh, Micah Kaplan. Oh, I will show him. Um, who uh, who had who had invited us, and I went without. Um, I know. I get it. I loved working with him. I loved working with him. Yeah, this is the first time I've talked about him since he passed away, actually. Um, but uh, he invited us, and uh, Sasha, the, our daughters were young, so Sasha couldn't go. So, so I went. And, uh, he had invited uh, Deborah from Hillel, and she was at our table, and and it was uh, that was my first exposure in Phoenix to JNF because we all knew about you know planting trees in Israel. Um, and then Deb Rochford was wonderful and, and asked us to co-chair the breakfast, and we did, and we did it again. And they had, the first time they asked uh, asked me to join the board, um, I said no. Uh, first two times I said no because the meetings are in the morning, and I love hanging out uh, with my wife and kids in the morning and dropping them off at school. And then uh, and then something happened. Something was Susan Farber became the president. And uh, in our household, we don't know how to say no to Susan Farber. <laughs> been, on, been on the board ever since, and she's a tremendous friend, along with George Weiss and others that are very supportive of JNF. So yeah, it's a it's a great organization. And the thing I like going back to Ria's question, it's it's also a great organization because it's the low hanging fruit for getting people involved in the Jewish community. Yes, it is. Because no matter what else you care about, when you can tell someone, you know, you know the map of Israel, yes, you know the border and the eastern side of it, how it's all mountains and it's all trees. The red, and yes. the red line. Yeah, the, the, those were planted by this nonprofit organization over 100 years ago before it was a nonprofit organization. You know, can I have $18 and you want to come to a free breakfast? And, uh, and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see next year what that breakfast looks like. And it's important to just keep reminding people. I just want to thank you for your involvement. You have just lifted the torch and carried it for JMF in the Valley. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Pleasure meeting you. And, and, and with that, my wife's going to kill me. Uh, Cause I, we thought it was me a half. <laughs> I told her, let me, let me I've know. I've been texting her. Don't worry, Rodney. Oh, really? I gave her a link to watch. Oh yeah. <laughs> well. Can I say one more thing? We also have to thank Levy for doing this and bringing all of this to everybody. No, he is, Levy Levitov is, uh, I'll never forget the day I met him because I was racing home that night because our neighbor was hosting Martha Stewart at her house. <laughs> and so I, I talked to him on the side of the road. I gave him those petitions and I went and saw Martha Stewart. She was in the condo next to ours. My wife almost killed me because I thought it was just like a private thing. We, we walked in, me and my wife and the girls in our pajamas. And there's Martha Stewart and the CEO of University of Phoenix having dinner. Um, 
but sure enough and two weeks later he called with those uh with those petitions and it's just uh you know the family's wonderful and they they before the covid thing we had a cool swim party uh and the kids love playing together and we're, we're just so lucky to have them you know, his whole family in our community and, and doing the kinds of things you know going back to what Rhea said to just keep us all engaged in our faith because it's uh, you know we just got an email from cbi our, our sunday school is going to be online you know and the hebrew school is going to be online and everything's going to be online and so I got to call you about Hebrew instructors, actually, uh, when this is over, I'll text you. But uh, it's just, it's, it's, we're, we, they're always asked to be, you know, I always subscribe to the, to the, you know, the, the cheapest house, nicest block. And when it comes to my faith, I have always said the same thing. I always say, you know, we're, we pretty much live a reformed life as Levy knows, but I married a Jewish gal and we like to be around uh, people who, you know, are, are, are even more engaged in the faith than we are. And that's why I'm, you know, our family is so lucky. Uh, to have the Levitos as friends, uh, because they really do help us all, you know, get a little bit more engaged in our faith. So thank you, Levy. And I'm lucky too, because I live next door to Levy's father. Very cool. <laughs> Judy, did you want to say something before we say goodbye to Rodney? Okay. Rodney, you're very humble, attributing everything to luck from one, from beginning to end. Um, luck happens to people who excel along the way and i think that's why you were able to move every step ahead according to how you did or uh maybe god maybe god oh, maybe uh, luck. not maybe i'm saying for sure for sure but next tuesday that primary election is based on telling people so if you have a chance and you know anyone with a ballot or you know anyone that's an independent that has a ballot or you have your ballot at home uh tell your neighbors and friends vote glassman or assessor we need to win so we can keep moving forward. And uh, it's uh, just another way we can do community service. So I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, Thank allowing you. me to visit with all of you. And Levy has my contact information. So if there's any uh, questions or anything I can help with in the future, please let me know because I'd love to. Thank you, Rodney. Safe drive back down to Phoenix. Thank you so much. This Thank you, great. everyone.